Today we will learn and reflect on the writings in the Philokalia by St. Nilos the Ascetic, also known as St. Nihilus of Sinai. So what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Can Christians study philosophy? When you are devout, how can you be sure that your devotions are not merely for display? How do you know your devotion is genuine? Why are we so distracted from living a godly life? Why do the years whittle away our devotion? How can possessions endanger our soul? What are the spiritual dangers for teachers and disciples? How can laymen apply the advice meant for monks by writers in the Philokalia to living their lives in an imperfect world? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. St. Nihilos was an abbot in a monastery near Ankara, now Turkey, early in the 5th century. Perhaps he was a disciple of St. John Chrysostom, and he definitely had his sharp tongue. He is the earliest writer to mention the Jesus Prayer in his other works. Dr. Wikipedia definitely affirms his connection with St. Chrysostom. He vigorously protested his persecution in a letter to the emperor. Later, he and his son joined a monastery in Palestine. And St. Nihilos was critical of Greek and Jewish philosophy and he opens his ascetic discourses. Many Greeks, and not a few Jews, attempted to philosophize, but only the disciples of Christ have pursued true wisdom, because they alone have wisdom as their teacher, showing them by his example the way of life they should follow. This reminds us of the question posed by Tertullian several centuries later. What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? While both criticize these pagan traditions, the Stoic philosophers had a deep influence on Eastern Christianity. In the opening work of the Greek Philokalia, it was relegated to the appendix by its English translators because they suspected that the author was a Stoic philosopher, since it contained few biblical references. St. Nihilos continues, For the Greeks, like actors on a stage, put on false masks. They were philosophers in name only, but lacked true philosophy. They displayed their philosophic calling by their cloak, beard, and staff, but indulged the body and kept their desires as mistresses. They were slaves to gluttony and lust, accepting this as something natural. They were subject to anger and excited by glory, and they gulped down rich food like dogs. St. Nihilos explicitly mocks the cynic philosopher Diogenes of Sinope. And he says this, The only object was to show off, and they endured hardships simply to gain cheap applause. Moreover, what can be more stupid than to keep silent continually, live on vegetables, cover oneself with ragged garments of hair, and spend one's days in a barrel? if one expects no recompense after death. Diogenes of Sinope was a student of the founder of the Cynics, Antisthenes, who was in turn a student of Socrates, and he was one of the dinner guests who spoke in Xenophon's Symposium. Diogenes of Sinope was perhaps the original hippie, challenging social conventions. Not only did he live in a large barrel in the Athenian market, he also masturbated in public. But he also provided an ascetic example that may have influenced the later monastics, and his sayings contributed to the Athenian culture that in turn influenced Christianity. Diogenes' student was Crates, whose student in turn was Zeno of Sicium, the founder of the Greek Stoic philosophers. Although Seneca mentions studying his works, only fragments of the works of the Greek Stoic philosophers have survived to the current day. Why were they lost to history? Perhaps Seneca's restatement of Stoicism was far superior to the Greek original. Or perhaps Zeno's writing offended the Christian scribes who declined to copy them for posterity. The ancient biographer Diogenes of Laertius, who preserved most of the fragments that have survived of the Greek Cynic and Stoic philosophers, stated that the libertine actions and teachings of Zeno and later Greek Stoics offended many in Athens. We do wholeheartedly agree with St. Nihilus' teaching. Philosophy is a state of moral integrity combined with a doctrine of true knowledge concerning reality. Both Jews and Greeks fall short of this, and he also has specific railings against Jews, for they rejected the wisdom that is from heaven and tried to philosophize without Christ, who alone has revealed the true philosophy in both his life and his teaching. We believe that you should reflect on both Stoic philosophy and the writings of the Jewish rabbis, as both Judaism and Stoicism prepared the world for Christ. Christian monastic teaching enriches Stoicism. Likewise, studying the teachings of the early and medieval Jewish rabbis can enrich your Christianity. Should St. Nihilos have compared the Greek philosophers to dogs gulping down rich food? During his day, 
Christians still felt insecure and embattled. The reign of Emperor Julian the Apostate was still in living memory. Many feared that a subsequent emperor may mainstream paganism and restart the persecution of Christians once again. Now the modern experience differs. World War II promoted democracy while discrediting the fascist regimes, many of which supported Catholicism. Today's global economy and migration means that many of us have business associates or friends or relatives have differing religious faiths and philosophies. Definitely denigrating other religious traditions is spiritually dangerous. And the Vatican II decrees teach us that we should be respectful of other religious traditions. And St. Nielos discusses how false asceticism is merely for show. St. Nielos reflects on how Christians should avoid these spiritual traps that so many Greeks and Jews succumb to. St. Nielos teaches us that the apostles adopted a harsh and strenuous way of life, facing every kind of adversity, afflicted, tormented, harassed, naked, lacking even necessities, and finally they met death boldly, imitating their teacher faithfully. After Emperor Constantine favored Christianity, ending the persecutions, Christians could only challenge their faith through monasticism. St. Nielos teaches us that although all Christians should have modeled their own life on this image, most of them either lacked the will to do so or else made only feeble efforts. In the ancient world was a different world. St. Nielo speculates that many come to the monastic life because of some pressure, not realizing what is involved. So they regard it merely as a way of making a living. And we ponder this also in our reflection on Dark Night of the Soul by St. John of the Cross, where his monks rebelled against his insistence on strict monastic observance of diet and prayers. In the ancient and medieval world, monasteries played the same role that the military does today. It was often the default career path for young men who did not have a clear career path. And the monasteries were much larger than they are today. St. Nielos even says that many ancient citizens were critical of the low standard of monastics in their day. St. Nielos notes that the monastic movement began with great promise, where envy, malice, arrogance, and haughtiness were banished, along with all that leads to discord. But as the decades passed, this strict and angelic way of life suffered the fate of a portrait many times recopied by careless hands, until all likeness to the original had been lost. St. Nielo speaks of his fellow monks, We no longer pursue plainness and simplicity of life. We no longer value stillness, which helps to free us from past defilement, but prefer a whole host of things which distract us uselessly from our true goal. Rivalry over material possessions has made us forget the counsel of the Lord, who has urged us to take no thought for earthly things, but to seek only the kingdom of heaven. St. Nielos tells us, fellow monks, we distinguish ourselves merely by the habit we wear, not by our way of life. We reject all ascetic effort, but madly desire a reputation for asceticism. We had to base the truth into play acting. Now how different is this from Christianity of today? St. Nielos contrasts the holy men who live for the soul alone, turning away from the body and its wants, the holy men who have no need to flatter the wealthy because they live simply, to those of us who, instead of courageously struggling against our difficulties, come fawning to the wealthy, like puppies wagging their tails in the hope of being tossed a bare bone or some crumbs. To get what we want, we call them benefactors and protectors of Christians, attributing every virtue to them, although they may be utterly wicked. How can possessions endanger our soul? St. Nielos reminds us how Jesus exhorts us in the Sermon of the Mount. Do not resist one who is evil, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your coat, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Can Christians live up to this ideal? Should Christians always live up to this ideal? Does Jesus want us to live the life of a wussy wookie or a walking carpet? If we have a family, we are obligated to provide for them. And since we do not want to be a burden for society, we cannot allow someone to defraud us of much of our assets without complaint. But we must not allow our possessions to possess us. St. Nielos teaches us, possessions arouse feelings of jealousy against their owners, divide families, and make friends hate one another. Possessions have no place in the life to come, and even in this present life have no great use. Why then do we abandon the service of God and devote ourselves entirely to empty trivialities? For it is God who supplies us with all that we need. St. Nielos asks us, is it ever right to engage in disputes in order to protect our property? Should we not do as Jesus bids us, to also give our cloak to those who take our coat, to walk two miles when we are forced to walk one, to turn the other cheek? How should we act when our neighbor steals our treasure, 
such as when Jezebel had Naboth killed so she could steal his vineyard for her husband Ahab. Must we lose all self-control in such situations and become worse than madmen? St. Nilos asks, why do we try to make other people's properties our own, weighing ourselves down with material fetters? We must also be thankful to God for his gifts for our abilities that enable us to earn a good living. St. Neolus notes that Job's greatest sin was to raise his hand to his mouth and kiss it. Likewise, many people kiss their hands, saying it is their hands which bring them prosperity. St. Neolus warns us, through our anxiety about worldly things, we hinder the soul from enjoying divine blessings, and we bestow on the flesh greater care and comfort than are good for it. And what are the lessons we can draw from the examples of Elijah and Elisha? St. Neolus teaches us that Elijah and Elisha became what they were through their courage perseverance and indifference to the things of this life. They practiced frugality by being content with little. They reached a state in which they wanted nothing, and so came to resemble the bodiless angels. Thus they became stronger than the greatest of earthly rulers. They speak more boldly to crown monarchs than any king does to his own subjects. And the prophets displayed many signs, blinded an imposing army, fire was sent down from heaven to consume offerings on altars, a leper was healed, and a young daughter was resuscitated. St. Neolos teaches us that these holy men achieved such things because they had resolved to live for the soul alone, turning away from the body and its wants. The fact of needing nothing made them superior to old men. They chose to forsake the body and to free themselves from life in the flesh, rather than to betray the cause of holiness, and because of their bodily needs to flatter the wealthy. But as for us, when we lack something, instead of struggling courageously against our difficulties, we come fawning to the rich, like puppies wagging their tails in the hope of being tossed a bare bone or some crumbs. And what are the spiritual dangers for teachers and their disciples? St. Neolos repeats a warning of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, because you shut the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you traverse sea and land to make a single proselyte. And then when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much of a child of hell as yourselves. And who are the Pharisees? Here the Pharisees are anyone who seeks to be a spiritual teacher. St. Neolos teaches us that in reality, by rebuking the Pharisees in this way, he was warning those who in the future would make the same mistake, so that from fear of his condemnation they would restrain their improper desire for human glory. Now, when we volunteer to serve in a ministry, St. Neolos teaches us that first we must struggle against our own passions, watching and keeping in mind the course of our own spiritual battle. And then, on the basis of personal experience, we can advise others about this warfare and render victory easier for them by describing the tactics beforehand. St. Neolos says that some self-appointed teachers with little experience seek glory in how many disciples they can attract, as today television and YouTube preachers often seek as large an audience as possible. They become arrogant, even giving orders, not for the benefit of their disciples, but to promote their own pleasure. On the other hand, those uniquely qualified to be teachers, as St. Nilo states, who perceive in themselves some fruit of virtue and feel its benefits, refuse to assume leadership even when pressed by others, because they prefer this benefit to receiving honor from men. And what are the responsibilities of the teachers and their disciples? St. Nilo teaches us that the teacher's ineptitude destroys the disciples, and the disciples' negligence endangers the teachers, especially when, because of his ineptitude, they grow lazy. For it is the teacher's duty to notice and correct his disciples' faults, and it is the disciples' duty to obey all his instructions. It is a serious and dangerous thing both for them to commit sins and for him to overlook them. And St. Neolos is referring to an abbot of a monastery. He knows all his monks and interacts with them on a daily basis. This close control is spiritually dangerous if a priest tries to supervise his parishioners this closely. But when you confess to a Catholic or Orthodox priest who knows you well, you should be reluctant not to follow their spiritual advice during confession. You should select a priest whom you respect and feel comfortable with in bearing your soul during confession. St. Neolos reminds us that there are those who become clerics for imperfect motives. Under the influence of self-esteem, a man may perhaps enter the priesthood or the life of monastic perfection. And because many come to him for help, this self-esteem makes him think highly of himself thanks to what he says and does. So, by beguiling him with such thoughts, self-esteem draws him far away from the inner watchfulness that he should possess. St. Neolos teaches us, every shameful thought formed in the mind is a secret idol. Virtue is a thing most delicately balanced. 
and that if neglected, it quickly turns into its opposite. When an athlete's body is thrown to the ground, he can easily get up. But in the spiritual warfare, it is men's soul that fall, and then it is very difficult for them to rise up once more. St. Helos continues, the lawgiver, symbolically commanding us to deny entry to sensual pleasure, told us to watch the head of the serpent because it is watching our heel. Its aim is to bite our heel and so to poison us, whereas our aim is to crush every provocation to sensual pleasure. For when the provocation is crushed, sensuality has little power over us. Now St. Augustine teaches that all scriptures should be interpreted to further the twofold love of God and love of neighbor in our heart. And if a passage appears to violate this twofold love, then it should be interpreted allegorically. And one such verse is a favorite verse of the church fathers in the Philokalia. And that is where the Jews imagine what it would be like to smash the heads of Babylonian babies against the rocks. St. Neolos teaches us that the Psalms praise those who do not wait for the passions to grow to full strength, but kill them in their infancy. Happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. And St. Neolos also draws spiritual lessons from several Old Testament Bible stories. And the first is of Lot and his wife. The angels inform them that God will send fire down to destroy the sinful city of Sodom, and that they must flee and not look back. St. Neolos teaches us that we gain nothing, therefore, by a decision to renounce earthly things if we do not abide by it, but continue to be attracted by such things and allow ourselves to keep thinking about them. By constantly looking back like Lot's wife towards what we have renounced, we may clear our attachment to it. For she looked back and turned into a pillar of salt, remaining to this day as an example to the disobedient. She symbolizes the force of habit which draws us back again after we have tried to make a definitive act of renunciation. In our prior video on slander, we reflected on the deceits that dominated the two generations of Jacob and Joseph, and how these deceits corrupted the family and caused much suffering. And one of these deceits, Rachel, who may have been resentful of the deceits that her father committed against her husband Jacob, stole the valuable household goods that belonged to her father, and then denying her theft. St. Neolos teaches us that the soul that succumbs to past habits gives all its attentions to the material things which lack true reality. It's like Rachel sitting on Laban's idols. It does not listen to the teaching which would raise it up to higher things, but says like Rachel, I cannot rise up before you, for the custom of woman is upon me. St. Neolos teaches us that avarice, anger, and dejection are all offshoots of gluttony. But the glutton needs money first of all, so as to satisfy his ever-present desire, even though it can never be satisfied. His anger is inevitably aroused against those who obstruct his acquisition of money, and in turn gives place to dejection when he proves too weak to get his way. For those who love pleasure, when deprived of it, grow angry and embittered. As well as nursing and feeding the passions, gluttony also destroys everything good. How can someone weighed down with wealth wrestle with the demon of avarice? And St. Neolos also draws a lesson from the story of Joseph, who was sold into slavery, and whose services were assigned to Potiphar, a court official. Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce Joseph, but he resisted. As a background to this story, in the ancient world, wrestlers wrestle in the nude, and men exercise in the nude at the gymnasium, and male nudity was not regarded as offensive in the ancient Greek world. St. Neolo says that a naked person is hard to even impossible to catch. If Joseph had been naked, the Egyptian woman would not have found anything to seize hold of. For the scriptures say that she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. Now garments are the physical things whereby sensual pleasure seizes hold of us and drags us about. For whoever is encumbered with such things will of necessity be dragged about by them against his will. And he continues, It is difficult for the devil to seize hold of one who has no worldly attachments. But when a man is full of anxiety about material things, the intellect, as though covered with dust, loses the agility which detachment confers upon it, and then it is hard for him to escape from the devil's grip. Detachment is the mark of a perfect soul, whereas an imperfect soul is worn down with anxiety about material things. St. Neolos teaches us, Do not let the purity of your virtue be clouded by the thoughts of worldly things. Do not let the intensity of your contemplation be disturbed by bodily cares. Then true wisdom will stand revealed in its full beauty, and it will no longer be maligned by insolent men because of our shortcomings, or mocked by those who know nothing about it. But it will be praised, if not by men, by the angelic powers and by Christ our Lord. St. Helos continues, From malice men often speak slanderously of what is good, 
but the tribunal on high gives judgment with impartiality and delivers its verdicts in accordance with the truth. St. Nilos concludes his ascetic discourse with, We need not worry about men's opinions, for men can neither reward those who have lived well nor punish those who have lived otherwise. If because of envy or worldly attachment they seek to discredit the way of holiness, they are defaming with deluded blasphemies the life honored by God and the angels. At the time of judgment, those who have lived rightly will be rewarded with eternal blessings, not on the basis of a public opinion, but in accordance with the true nature of their life. Our saint ends this with a short prayer. May all of us attain these blessings through the grace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and through the ages of ages. Amen. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Elos the Ascetic is one of the works included in the Philokalia. We also discovered this wonderful book of scholarly essays on the Philokalia. And we discuss the sources more in depth in our introductory video on the Philokalia. St. John Climacus explores many of the monastic themes that St. Nielos discusses, including cultivation of good habits and thoughts, detachments, envy, avarice, anger, dejection, chastity, fasting, moderation, and most important of all, true genuine faith in his ladder of divine ascent. Several of our icons of St. Nielos were from the Mystagogy website, and the thumbnail is a photo of a monastery on Mount Athos in Greece. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.